Joining us now, Rick reporter, one half of the rink by duo with Andrew Wadden is Mr. Jeff Patterson here with Secure Some Price. Jeff, uh, we said it was high event hockey against Pittsburgh the other day. It's a high issue high day. Drama. For the, yeah, high yeah. drama day for the Vancouver Canucks after last night and that loss to Tampa Bay. We'll, we'll start with Tanner Pearson and uh, multiple hand surgeries and out for the year. And Quinn Hughes' comment yesterday, and for those who missed it, I feel bad for him. I mean, it was... it. It was what it wasn't handled properly, and you know it's not really a good situation he's got there, and hopefully he's going to be all right. What do you know about this matter, and and how surprised are you to, to hear Quinn Hughes talking about it like that? Oh, I think I'm surprised on a couple of levels. One is uh, this was uh, thought to be a four to six week injury. There was hope that Tanner Pearson was going to be back before Christmas, and now his future, his uh, career, is being called into question. Uh, so lots of questions on that front. And look, Quinn Hughes, an incredible player, four years of really saying nothing to the mm-hmm. media and then just drops the atomic bomb, uh, which I just think speaks to a frustration level that clearly uh, has reached its breaking point with players. Because, again, <laughs> Quinn Hughes isn't here to create waves. He's out there to create incredible highlights. And he did again uh, with a goal and a great pass to JT Miller in the hockey game. But really none of that matters Uh, For Quinn Hughes, uh, if you watch the clip that the Canucks post after the game, there's a frustration there that I I just haven't seen from Quinn. And so I don't know if this was sort of a, damn it, I'm emptying emptying the chambers here and uh, and I don't care kind of thing. I do think he cares dearly about winning in the hockey club, but he just looked like he was a a guy at his breaking point. Uh, As for the ramifications, and look, I, I got into it with a lot of people on Twitter Uh, late last night after the Tampa game, I I, I get uh, we're in the business of gathering information. And so, yes, it's self-serving, but it's just not fair to Bruce Boudreaux to make Bruce Boudreaux answer questions about medical issues and sort of a hint of medical malpractice almost from one of your players. This goes above the coach, and we know that there's dysfunction between the coach and management, but it takes you right back to... Travis Green being trotted out two hours before puck drop in Toronto, having to answer for why Jake Furtanen has been placed on a leave of absence. Coaches have enough to worry about. Coaches have game plans. They're trying to win hockey games. Uh, I know it doesn't always look like it with this Vancouver Canuck group, but uh, where is upper management? Like, I know they're on a scouting trip and they're in South Florida, but we haven't seen or heard from Patrick Alvine, and we don't hear from Jim Rutherford, quite frankly, early on yep. in his tenure. He was available. He was front and center, whether it was Zoom, whether it was in person. These guys have gone months now without being made available to their constituents. Like It's fine for Jim Rutherford to open his uh, soul to a reporter in Pittsburgh, but the guy in Pittsburgh isn't paying the freight here. Like, this is... you know. And you can say, again, I, I get to some of you say, oh, this is self-serving. I don't I don't care what you think, Patterson. But the Canucks well, can't speak to 18,000 people that pay tickets on a nightly basis. And, and we know there are thousands more that are Canuck fans. So we are the conduit in the media. That's how it works. Uh, a select group has access. You go to the rink. You get to talk to the decision makers. And then, you know, you hear what they have to say. That, that's the way that this works. But even last night, again, this is another example the Canucks themselves cut out the Quinn Hughes clip out yes. of the thing that they posted. So you're not getting, you're getting what they want you to get. You're not getting the full and honest answers and access yeah. if you're relying on the hockey club itself. And so again, just dysfunction at so many levels, but uh, this is concerning. And to hear Quinn Hughes sort of speak out, lash out. And again, I wasn't in the room, so right. you know it's hard to know full, full context. But I'm glad Patrick Johnson was because otherwise uh, we yeah. wouldn't have had that quote. Well, and, and Jeff is you know to your point, it's an accountability matter that if you're going to be a leader, you got to be accountable. And too often, the owner and the managers of this club have not been accountable to uh, their public. I, I understand there's been a request made for Rutherford to speak Monday when the team gets back here, so we'll see uh, if, if they can um, meet that threshold uh, after their uh, mid mid season meetings in Florida. Uh, but lastly, when 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 you say, uh, you know, a hint of medical malpractice, um, let's remember they turned over the training staff here. Uh, that is always a dangerous place to go with players because trust builds up in the guys that have been treating them on a day-to-day basis. Early in the season, Jeff, and, and I believe you were, uh, I believe you heard this as well, 
we heard things about the space allotted for treatment at Rogers Arena, the time it was taking, and maybe even um, who and how many folks were going on the road to help the Vancouver Canucks. Do, do, do you think that that is rearing its head here? Do you think that there is a, a trust issue between the Canucks on the medical side? And this not for the first time, right? We've been down this road before with this organization. Do you think there's any kind of trust trust issues at play here between the dressing room? Uh, and the Canucks in terms of the way they have uh, appropriated their medical and training staff this year? I think the events of postgame last night now open that angle of questioning. I don't know what it's the first time that really we've heard a player suggest that publicly, but yeah, I mean, there was a full turnover of the medical staff. There was a group here that uh, had been here and been part of the fabric for the better part of a decade. And I do think you build those bonds and, and trust. And that's not to say that the new guys that were hired, look, this is professional sports. I want to trust and believe that the Vancouver Canucks are getting their players the best care possible. So I want to tread lightly here. Uh, I, I don't have any personal connection to the new training staff. So I, I'm not in any sort of position to, to judge them, but I do know this, that if you're going to move forward as an organization, like you can't have these cracks and fissures at any level. And yet it's just feeling like you've got the upper management that's throwing darts at the head coach. You've got players. Apparently there's friction at times in the locker room and that's understandable. Uh, But now these guys that rely on the training staff to get them healed up and get them back out there and on the ice doing what they do. And if uh, that's being called into question, then, Again, there's just dysfunction at so many levels. I just don't know how you operate, but like, what is the breaking point? Or maybe we're there, and maybe the product on the ice is uh, you know, proof of that. And just to add to all of this, and of course this would go back to last year and the staff last year, Jason Dickinson with a stark admission uh, in Chicago about what had ailed him. That was last. back in the fall, yeah. Right. When he mm-hmm. first landed in Chicago, remember there were those reports that the Canucks were a cliquey brunch and everybody kind of tracked it back to, oh, uh, it's got to be Dickinson. The report comes out of Chicago. He just arrives there. But also, uh, he revealed that he played most of last season with a broken hand. Now, again, overhaul of the medical staff. So we're talking about two different medical staff. I don't know if that makes it better or worse, though. If last right. year you had a guy with a broken hand who didn't, he didn't know about it. Like at some point, wouldn't you like go, Hey doc, the hands just still not feeling good. Like, can we not have a, a second look at this? Whatever the case, uh, you know, maybe that explains what was an overwhelmingly disappointing season for Jason Dickinson. But I kind of thought he was water under the bridge, but he's back. At least he's resurfaced in this one that, yeah, like that was bizarre uh, that they wouldn't have been able to deal with that properly and get him healed up and, and able to play at his highest level and now here we are. I mean, earlier this year, Brock Besser obviously had the surgery and then the, the scar that popped open. So this is the second hand issue that the Vancouver Canucks have had to deal with. I don't know if there are parallels here or if you could draw through line. But I know that Brock Besser had a hand injury that didn't heal properly. He had to step away, uh, miss some some more games. And then obviously Tanner Pearson. And I feel for Tanner Pearson. Like, it, it was a disaster of a season if even if he got back in the lineup. And the guy had one goal in 14 games, but he's a hockey player. He wants to play, and I'm sure he wanted to make up for what was a terrible first half by getting in there and contributing. He's liked in that locker room. He's got championship pedigree. He's always been looked at as a low-maintenance guy that coaches like having around because, uh, you know, he doesn't ruffle feathers and all that type of stuff. And now three procedures on the same hand, and Quinn Hughes is wondering if he's going to be able to resume his playing career. Like, that is, uh, we need to hear it from somebody that has some answers about where this went wrong and, you know, clear up a, a few of these things at the very least, because uh, Tanner Pearson's still under contract. He's a Vancouver Canucks. He's got a year left on his deal. Like there are business applications to Tanner Pearson and where it goes from here, as well as just hoping the best for uh, a guy who, you know, he's a pro athlete that wants to resume his career, but uh, we're not sure that that's going to be possible now. Couldn't agree with you more on, on, uh, on Hughes's uh, rising to the occasion here. And I think it, it, it's a, it's an underline and an exclamation mark on how big this issue must be in the Canucks room that Quinn Hughes of all guys is the one that brings this up. Um, and, and you're right about the media side of things too. I mean, this is why the, the players association should care about whether or not, uh, there are media truth, independent media that covers a, any given team. Because if Quinn Hughes says that and there's only in house media, yeah. Only Canucks.com people. Guess what? The people 
this message doesn't get heard by anybody. The tree is falling in the forest. So uh, it, it's why more than just the media should care about the lack of media that covers the team. Just, well, just a I couple think on top of that quickly, guys, it's just that uh, clearly Quinn Hughes has information that we don't. Like, it sounds like yeah. players must have talked about this. Uh, like, for sure. say that. Of course. Obviously, he knows some things. So, uh, yeah. I think that's, and look, clearly, it's... Jeff Tanner Pearson is some upset with some part of this, uh, or I don't think you get Quinn Hughes saying what he said last night and, and going to bat. First team in. Just a couple of bits of context on this, gentlemen. Uh, I believe it was last week, might have been the week before, but the Athletic had a story about Quinn Hughes sort of looking to step up as a leader and assert yeah. himself. The other thing is, is he's under contract longest here, right? Well, I guess JT Miller now, but he's here for the long haul as a young player. So I think that is part and parcel of, hey, if I'm going to be here through 26 27, um, you best take care of my teammates better. We got to have faith in the medical and the training staff. And we can't have situations like this where a guy who we're hoping to be four to six weeks out and maybe uh, is going to miss the season. So maybe it's just you know, a little is, bit. Yeah. He's starting to score goals too. Yeah. Starting to well, score I goals, mean, I, so maybe that's it too. I, I, I think this is the natural evolution and development and maturation of, of Quinn Hughes uh, into a, a, a larger voice on this team, which brings us to Elias wearing an A yesterday uh, in lieu of Oliver Ekman Larson. Um, Cause we had wondered are they even going to bother uh, on a single-game scratch? They did. I've been on this train for a while. They should have empowered him out of training camp. What do you think, Jeff? Is Lee's going to get an A permanently here? Are they going right back to Oliver ekman Larson wearing an A? Uh, I, I mean, I have no knowledge that they're going to strip OEL, uh, a guy who is known by letters. Uh, what's one more? Um, I, so, look, Bruce Boudreaux's pattern with all of these high-profile scratches, Garland and Kuzmenko, uh, is that he's got that guy right back in the very next game. Like, this isn't, you know, OEL's not going to sit out for a while here. So I, I'm pretty sure that he plays. There's questions about Dermot and his health. Uh, but beyond that, I think OEL, the plan is sit him down, send the message, and get him back in there. I assume he's going to wear an A. But when I heard yesterday that he was on the fourth pair of the morning skate, one of my first thoughts was, oh, wow, okay, he wears a letter. Uh, who's going to wear his letter? Tyler Myers has always been the next guy up when it comes to, you know, sort of stepping in in the leadership group. But remember in the preseason, we saw both Hughes and Pedersen, and I remember asking Bruce Boudreau if that was sort of a nod to their role uh, in the hierarchy of the hockey club sort of now, but also moving forward. And he said, absolutely. And so I, I was curious and, and I guess kind of hopeful that, yeah, they would stitch an A on Pedersen and, I didn't think it was going to change the way he played. And he went out there last night and did his thing and had a couple of points and blocking shots and eight shots on goal. He's on an absolute bender right now, putting pucks on the net. I think he's got uh, 27 shots in his last four games. So, uh, you know, it was nice to see him score because he was getting all these shots and, and you just knew he was too talented and had the puck on his stick in offensive situations. So trying to lead by example, but I think he does that every night. But I think this tells us now that any time, like, you know, if Bo Horvat is in fact traded or if Miller or OEL comes out of the lineup again, then, yeah, I, I think they're bypassing Tyler Myers. And it's it was Patterson last night. It might be Quinn Hughes the next time, although maybe Quinn's going to be in the organizational bad books after uh, after his, uh, his outburst. So who knows how that will play out. But, yeah, it was the right thing. And I think big picture, look, the guys in the room, they know who the best players are, who the true leaders of this hockey club are. And Elias Pettersson with two points up to 50 at the midway mark, and he missed two games. So still on pace for a 100-point season. He's trying his best to to make things happen, and you're damn right. He's uh, one of the true leaders in that locker room. So uh, I don't know that it's going to be the rest of this season, but I would think as early as next season you will see that be a permanent fixture uh, on uh, his jersey. And Hughes, 3.9, he's up to 36. Tied Andre Kuzmenko, one off of JT Miller for third on the hockey club. Blake? You uh, you felt bad about uh, Bruce Boudreau having to answer for the for the uh, trainer's questions or the medical questions. Um, we shouldn't feel bad about criticizing his personnel decisions late in that hockey game. Curtis Lazar out there, your your thoughts on that decision? Um I mean, I, I, I don't think there's any way to spin that decision. I mean, I think you could spin decisions like putting Dakota Joshua out there before you can defend Curtis Lazar. Um, I mean, I, it, to me, it's befuddling. Uh, and it was for me as well. And I, I think, so Garland gets punched. I think his helmet got ruined, or not ruined, but damaged. So mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden, Connor Garland, uh, he's not available. I thought Lazar was out there because it was a right shot face-off in the offensive zone, and I just thought so for face-off support for Bo Horvat, 
And in fact, I thought maybe Lazar was going to take the face-off, but it was Horvat that took the draw. So maybe he was face-off support. But beyond that, uh, you know, maybe sort of like big body puck retrieval. Uh, but you've got Besser, you've got Miller, you've got Horvat out there. Like all three of those guys sort of fit that yeah. bill. And then you've got Kuzmenko, who is a threat, is a right shot. So is Lazar. So if it was a right shot thing, uh, yeah, I, I think there were just too many things in that hockey game, quite frankly, that that didn't get asked of Bruce post game. But I would have been really curious to hear his explanation because, uh, uh, you know, Kuzmenko has feasted at the front of the net. Uh, you get one chance to tie a hockey game. I, I, I think, and I posed the question on Twitter, you know, would Kuzmenko have scored in that spot? It kind of was a mix. I think Lazar was in too tight. Vasilevsky's aggressive. He's one of the best goaltenders in the world. But still, I'd take my chances with a guy who has put pucks in the net as opposed to a guy with one goal, and it came in the third game of the season. Jeff, uh, Sergei Jeff punches Garland, as you mentioned. We saw Miller slamming a stick. We saw Horvat kicking a gate. Quinn at the end smashing his stick. Like, was that a Wolfpack moment? Miss, did you think that someone ought to come and step up for Connor Garland a little more robustly than they did after he gets sucker punched in the face like that? I, I, I saw the quotes from Horvat that he thought there was going to be a penalty, and quite frankly, I guess so did I. Uh, it's a one-goal game. You don't want to do anything stupid. Now, does a win mean much to the Vancouver Canucks? Uh, would you like? Would you like more pushback? It kind of reminded me of Mike Matheson on Elias Pettersson a little bit. Uh, same state, different arena, obviously, but a few years ago, where you know the Canuck players, oh, we didn't really see what happened. It was behind the bench or behind the net. We were on the bench and. You know, there were a lot of reasons why nobody sort of stepped in there. Uh, they play Tampa next week. I do wonder if they've taken receipts here, if that's the case. Uh, you know, let's see how it plays out. Um, but I think the guys on the ice, you know, not many of them are – like, Bo Horvat, that's not really in his DNA. And I, I don't mean that as a knock, but that's – like, Bo would rather punish you with a goal. And I think they thought maybe they had momentum and that uh, they would squeeze right. out one more to tie. So There's a difference between when that happens in the first versus when that happens late in the third. You scored two straight goals, and the th- you know the fifth leading scorer on the in the league is is right beside him. He he wants to score the tying goal. He doesn't want to go to the box, right? I know there's always going to be people with a bloodthirst, but the game has yeah. changed. And yeah. and again, let's see if uh, they take a number and if somebody challenges. I mean, Sergachev. Uh, that's not really in his character either, but quite frankly, uh, and we've already seen it today, guys, uh, in the light of day, the Department of Player Safety has stepped in and fined somebody for something in a game last night. Like, they can after the fact. And, you know, is a fine going to do much? But it, No, but at least it shows that the Department of Player Safety is stepping in is and watching. acknowledging yes. that. Because we saw the other night in Pittsburgh, the referee that threw his arms in the air with two seconds left in the second period. Uh, too late in the period to make a call. Like, what is going on with these guys? And quite frankly, I just don't think the refereeing lives up to the standard that the players themselves uh, put forth on a nightly basis. And so I know this has been an age-old thing. We're never going to get access to referees uh, after the game. But there's two examples, the last two Canuck games alone, that I would have loved to have heard from a referee. Like, wow. you know, you're telling me that you look at the clock and say, uh, too late in the period, can't be bothered. And then last night, Sergachev, uh, you know, that's a dangerous play. It is. An unsuspecting guy gets punched in the face. Like, I'm glad Garland popped up, but he wasn't available to them, you know, for the final shift of the hockey game. And it uh, could have been a whole lot worse than that. I mean, at the risk of um, people bringing up my episode in San Jose with Kelly Sutherland, why not? You hear from umpires and basketball officials now all the time? Post game explaining a call. Like, yeah, just you wonder why this league is so terrified because of transparency. It has never been better. Just ask right. Gary himself. <laughs> And, the, and, and our fans don't um, want to hear from the referees. No, no exactly. Fans, no, we, I know what our fans have, want. Yes. Yeah, we have super secret data that we yeah. have culled <laughs> from really important pollsters like Fran, Frank Luntz who tell us our they fans. They want silent referees. They want they silent want moving referees. moving boards. They want moving, moving boards. boards. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and they want an all-star game. They really <laughs> love the all-star game. Uh, Jeff, I know you've been on the train of uh, there's been so many moments to move on Boudreaux. And they haven't yet, and so maybe they're just going to play out this season oh, with. Oh, him. By the way, we should. I, I'll step in. Yeah. Sergeyev has been fined. Ah, okay. it's happened. Oh, yes. It's made everything right. better. Yeah, I um, take back every mean thing I just said about. 
Uh, Dragger told us Wednesday he thought February and, uh, you know, the way things are going here, um, you do wonder whether that break at the end of January allows them uh, the time and the logistics to make the move. We're asking on the Bodog poll question here. I'm not going to ask you if you think Bruce is going to get fired. I mean, we, I think we all know it's a, a matter of when, not if. Uh, who do you want for Canucks next coach? Burnett, Colleton, Talkett, Trotz, feel free to go off the board. What do you think? Yeah, and I've always looked at that uh, week leading into the All-Star break as uh, just feels like a a spot. If you were going to make a change, you could get somebody in. They could get on the ground, catch their breath, a couple of practices before the Canucks head out on uh, another Eastern road trip. Uh, but I do wonder, guys, like these two games back-to-back, Florida, and then you've seen what Carolina's done to a lot of teams of late. Uh, that's not going to be an easy game. Bruce said yesterday that he wasn't going to go with the same goaltender uh, in back-to-backs. So I would assume that means Spencer Martin and then it's going to be Colin Delia in Carolina and the you know fifth game and eight nights and what's this team going to have left. And and the bottom is falling out. We're, we're seeing that. I mean, five straight road losses. Uh, they have one win in their last seven games in this 12-game stretch that we always thought was going to be a monumental task for them. So uh, I kind of looked at that week off at the end of January into February, but... I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of feel now like Bruce is back uh, day by day and almost minute by minute. And if things really spiral out of control here against Florida and Carolina, two teams that can score in bunches, and we know that the Canucks can't defend, you come off the road, you've got Tampa, Colorado, and Edmonton at home next week. Uh, there's still half a season to go. Like, they yeah. have to continue to put a product and run this team out there in Oof. front of the fans. I, I, I do wonder if they have to get proactive and maybe move up their timelines at some point just to to show the fan base that you know they still have a hand on the wheel here. So uh And Jeff, you wonder whether that might be a decision coming out of these mid season meetings in Florida. Absolutely. Uh, you wonder yep. whether people stand up and say, guys, we just can't abide anymore with this coach and no structure. And even and what's for tankist guys, even for people that are hoping for the higher draft pick it's it's just a it's just a gesture. It's just a gesture of we see what you're seeing. Don't worry, and, and we we are managing. Like it, it's not really to win more games per se. It's more just a gesture of we are managing. We are on the job at the very least, right? Because it's probably not likely to do anything. Right, and you talk about the candidates that are available. I suppose the other option is to wait until the off season when maybe more candidates. Uh, are there. Maybe you've got a larger crop to choose from, but they've been linked to talk it now for a while. There are personal relationships. I, I do think where there's some smoke, uh, there might someday be some fire. Uh, I wondered about Jeremy Colleton at the same time. Uh, just talking to people in hockey, they think he's doing a great job in Abbotsford, but they also see him as a uh, more of a development guy rather than, you know, the coach that's going to take this group to the next level. And so uh, I don't know if that works against him, but uh, I hope he continues to do good things down in Abbotsford because they do seem to have things sorted out and have some structure uh, on the on the farm with the baby Canucks. You know, Barry Trotz, it sounded like he wanted to take an entire season here and truly step away from the game, but... You know, money talks and uh, the right opportunity to work in a Canadian market, perhaps. I mean, wouldn't that be night and day to go from Bruce Boudreaux and no structure to Barry Trotz, one of the uh, most structured guys uh, in the last, what, 25 years in the National Hockey League? So uh, who knows? I mean, Barry's a great guy to deal with. I certainly would uh, take him on a, a daily basis just with the Q&A part. But uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, right yeah. now, it, it has I think... to be tr- talk it has to be the front runner. Uh, again, there's just too many ties. He's available. Uh, he's got a pretty cushy gig doing the TV, and I think he's done a nice job, and I think he enjoys it. But uh, it does sound like he does. He wants to get back into the coaching realm here at some point. Yeah, I, I think if you're hiring Trots, you're probably making Mikey O an interim for the rest of the yes. year. Um, yeah. Same with, with Brunette. Anybody, you could do same that. with Brunette. Talk it. You can get in here early. Carlton, of course, you could uh, bump up, and if you have designs on others. Uh, then uh, I suspect the exploration is going to start now if it hasn't already. Jeff Patterson, marvelous stuff. Thank you for this today. We'll catch up on Monday. Have a great weekend uh, with Andrew covering a couple of games there. <laughs> Let's see what the weekend brings. Right. Sure. Sorry about the weekend. Exactly. <laughs> a good time or sorry Who knows about the what could happen here? Or we might be doing an emergency pod. Yes. Uh, That's the way things are going. Bring on the second half. <laughs>